Okay, I think uh, it will be time to start, uh, André. So it's a pleasure to see you on this Zoom uh, seminar, uh, which are common with the Free Femme Days and the Lab. And uh, you are very welcome to present uh, your work on uh, this complex uh, mechanical structure. Thank you very much indeed, Francois. Uh, uh, Frederick, it really is a huge uh, pleasure uh, to, to be able to, to contribute to this. I mean, I, such a great pretty, pity that we can't be all together in Paris, really unfortunate. So let me thank you, uh, uh, Frederick Francois, uh, for, for inviting me along. So, uh, so this uh, talk concerns what are known as implicitly constitutive fluid flow models, and I'll be talking about the analysis of these models and finite uh, element approximation. Um, so this is based on joint work with several people. So Mira Bulicek and Josef uh, Malek uh, at the Charles University in Prague uh, got me going in, in this area. And I think this really is a very exciting and uh, interesting area with lots of open problems. Um, in the area of analysis of partial differential equations that arise in these models, there has been a certain amount of work, but in the area of numerical analysis of uh, uh, finite element approximations, in particular of these models, there has been really very limited amount of work. So somehow uh, the purpose of this talk is, is to uh, draw this uh, to your attention as, as that's an interesting area. So I was uh, in the area of numerical analysis, collaborating with Lars Deening at Bielefeld and Christian Kreutzer uh, at Dortmund. Uh, Tabea Chirpel was my doctoral student at Oxford, and she's now at Bielefeld with uh, Lars Deening. Alexei Gaska Orozco uh, was my doctoral student here at Oxford, and he too moved to uh, Germany to Erlangen Nuremberg. Patrick Farrell is my colleague here at Oxford. So perhaps a good place to start uh, in the description of these implicitly constituted fluid flow models is to highlight uh, the fundamental equations that underlie these models of fluid flow, balance of linear momentum, conservation of angular momentum, conservation of mass, and uh, the principle of uh, maximal entropy production, which are uh, the equations that you see on this slide. So the first equation, which in, in the case of Newtonian fluids gives rise to uh, the Navier-Stokes equations is this equality here, balance of linear momentum, the symmetry of this tensor T, and T here is uh, the stress tensor, the Cauchy stress tensor is conservation of angular momentum. Rho is the density of the fluid, U is the velocity, and F is the density of external forces, so maybe gravity. The second equality is conservation of mass, and uh, this uh, final uh, equality here is this principle of maximal entropy production. Psi here is the entropy production, and so in uh, agreement with thermodynamics, this uh, entropy production is supposed to be greater than uh, equal than zero, which means that entropy in this closed system will always be increasing. So here for the purpose of this talk, but I'll talk about extensions later on, we shall assume that uh, we are in the isothermal case, so the temperature will be assumed to be constant. In a second, I shall also assume again for the simplicity in this talk that the density is constant, so there will be uh, some simplification in these equations. In particular, if the density is assumed to be constant, rho being here the density, rho sub t vanishes, and if rho is a constant, then this second equation becomes just divergence u equal to zero. And then also, if you are assuming, again, for the simplicity in this talk, that you are in the steady state case, that uh, the time derivative also vanishes here, so this first term uh, will also vanish. But we'll see that uh, simplification on the next slide. So let me just comment uh, once again on the notation. So once again, rho here is the density, u is the velocity, t up here is the Cauchy stress, f uh, is the density of external forces, d of u appearing here is the symmetric velocity gradient, also called the rate of strain tensor. Psi, this function psi here, is called the Helmholtz free energy, and psi, as I said, is the entropy uh, production. 
So if you assume that the density is constant, then not only this equation, the second equation simplifies that uh, if rho is constant, then psi of rho is constant, and the time derivative of that becomes zero. So this um, uh, principle of maximal entropy production also simplifies because you lose this uh, second term here on the left-hand side. And this, again, for the purpose of this talk, will be the set of equations I shall be looking at. So we are looking here at the special case when uh, the problem is not only uh, in the isothermal regime, but uh, we are dealing with a homogeneous fluid, the density is constant, and let's suppose that we are at steady state, and then from those more complicated equations, we collapse to these uh, three equations here, where T, once again, is the Cauchy stress tensor, which is assumed to be symmetric, and Psi is the entropy production, which is greater than equal than zero. But then in order to uh, close the system of uh, equations, you also need a constitutive relation. And the constitutive relation is some kind of relationship that uh, relates the Cauchy stress tensor with B of U, this symmetric velocity gradient. And depending now on what kind of fluid you are describing, this constitutive equation will vary from fluid to fluid. Before I give you examples, let me just make one remark, what is usually done is the Cauchy stress tensor is decomposed into one part here, S. So think about T as a, a matrix. You decompose this matrix T into a part that has uh, zero trace. So the trace of S in the sense of matrices, trace of S is equal to zero. And then the trace of the original matrix T is put into this part here. So it's sort of a decomposition of the Cauchy uh, stress into this um, a traceless part, which is called the deviatoric or shear stress, and then this other part is the pressure. And so what we will have in a moment is various relationship, various constitutive relations that relate S here to D of U, depending on the fluid. The simplest possible case is to take a Navier-Stokes fluid where you have a linear relationship between this deviatoric or shear stress and D of U, the symmetric velocity gradient. So S in that case uh, is two mu when you use the viscosity coefficient times D of U. And so uh, if you take this S here and you plug it back into this uh, decomposition of the Cauchy stress, so uh, T now with this formula for S, and minus pi is plugged back into the equation, you arrive at the Navier-Stokes equation. So the first term is copied above, from above, and uh, div t gives rise through this decomposition to two terms, minus mu times Laplace of the velocity plus gradient of the pressure is equal to f. Divergence u is equal to zero. And now the question is what happens to this third relation? Have we um, satisfied this relationship r uh, is this model consistent with uh, the laws of thermodynamics? So let's just check what happens uh, with uh, T scalar product with D of U. Okay, so uh, Xi, the entropy production by definition is T scalar product with D of U in the sense of matrices, in the, in that you multiply appropriate elements of the matrices together and you add them up. So this is the uh, definition of this uh, double dot notation. So scalar product of T and D of U. Uh, T, because of this decomposition, is S minus PI, but then if you take the inner product of PI contained in T with D of U, the scalar product of I and D of U is the trace of this symmetric matrix D of U, but the trace of D of U is really just the divergence of U, and the divergence of U is equal to zero by assumption. So basically, when you take the scalar product, you lose this uh, pressure part, and what you end up with, uh, uh, T scalar with DU becomes S scalar product with DU. And then you could plug in this constitutive relationship here into this formula, and you can do this in two ways. You could either plug in S, uh, instead of this S, or you could express D of U in terms of S, and then you could plug in D of U and eliminate D of U in terms of S. So what is written here is basically a compromise between these two options. You take one half of one option and the other half of the other option, and what you end up with is not two mu times uh, D of U squared, but just one mu times D of U squared, and then the other mu D of U squared is written as one over four mu uh, times uh, the norm of this matrix. So these double, sorry, the single bars denote uh, what is called the Frobenius norm, or uh, uh, 
sum of squares of entries in the matrix. So clearly this is a, a non-negative expression, which is good news because we have satisfied uh, the third law here also. But just for the purpose of uh, the calculations that will follow, let me note uh, just a trivial observation that this expression here can be bounded further below by taking the minimum of mu and one over four mu. So you have a single constant that uh, multiplies uh, d of u, the norm of d of u squared plus uh, the matrix norm of s squared. And clearly this is non-negative. So in the case of um, this nebulous field fluid, these exponents here are two and two. And that is associated with the fact that we have this linear relationship uh, between uh, the deviatoric or shear stress and the symmetric velocity gradient. So this is what happens in the case of Newtonian fluids. There are, however, lots of other fluids. So basically you go around the house, you open the fridge and you will find various creams and you go to the bathroom, you will also find creams or you go out to the shed, you will find paints and various exotic fluids which depend in ways which are not uh, similar to how water uh, behaves. So here's one, uh, this is called the Paolo or Oswald de Valle fluid where you have a Paolo type relationship in the special case, if you took R to be equal to two, uh, this uh, nonlinear term would vanish and you would go back to a nebulous state fluid. So this is sort of a generalization. There are generalized power law fluids where in, instead of this uh, exponential behavior here, uh, you have some that continuous function, which is typically monotonic increasing of the norm of D of U squared. These are called generalized power law fluids. There are situations where, um, d of u is given as a function of s rather than s being given as a function of d of u. There are, I mean, there's a whole zoo of these models. There are also models where this is not just a continuous relationship, but there's um, a, a set of inequalities, which in fact describe a discontinuous relationship between s and uh, d of u. So here's one, this is called the Bingham uh, model or uh, Herschel Buckley, Buckley fluid where the situation is the following. As long as the magnitude of uh, the shear stress is below a certain critical threshold called the yield stress, uh, D, that is D of U, the symmetric velocity gradient is equal to zero. Once the magnitude of S exceeds this uh, threshold, then the fluid starts to move according to uh, a certain uh, formula. So what I have next to me, I don't know whether you can see me, not just the slides um, here. So I don't know whether you can, do you see this? So it's toothpaste. Um, so what I'm doing, I'm pressing this toothpaste and nothing is, there is no lid on it. I'm pressing this toothpaste and there's nothing coming out of the tube. I keep on pressing and I'm pressing and pressing and nothing happens until I press hard enough. And once I have pressed hard enough, the fluid starts to move. So you can see the fluid coming out, it flows. And so this is an example of, of uh, a Bingham fluid. So what is interesting about this Bingham fluid example is that you can, uh, so this is just a little uh, algebraic exercise. It is possible to describe this pair of inequalities written here as a single implicit relationship between D and S uh, given by this formula. And this plus here is a positive part of this expression. So I shan't dwell on the details. You can verify that this single equality encapsulates these two uh, inequalities here. So the reason I've written this down is to highlight the fact that in addition to Navier-Stokes, you have these nonlinear relationships and sometimes these nonlinear relationships can be very nonlinear. In fact, they can be implicit. What is interesting about them uh, in all of these examples that even though you may have a nonlinear relationship, this nonlinear relationship, at least in these situations, is all, always a monotone relationship in the following sense. So in the case of um, the Navier-Stokes equations, we have a linear relationship. In the case of these parallel fluids, we have a nonlinear relationship, which is a sort of a, a monotone graph here. In the case of these Bingham fluids, you see this jump in the graph. So the shear rate remains uh, at uh, zero you keep on raising the, the stress up until this point where the yield stress 
is attained and then the fluid starts to move according to one formula or according to a different formula. So in all of these cases, we have um, monotone functional relationships. Some of them are discontinuous. And the idea would be that instead of thinking of functional relationships, which may be continuous or discontinuous, think about all of these graphs as graphs, as continuous graphs. So I'll come to this in a moment. But let me first of all reference these important works by Raja Gopal and Raja Gopal and Srinivasa, where these ideas were uh, first uh, put forward in, in the context of um, mechanics of fluids. There's also PD analysis of these models by Mira Buricek and Josef Malek in Prague and Piotr Gwiazda and Agnieszka Sviatsevska Gwiazda uh, in, in, in Warsaw. There are two papers here. One is on steady models and the other one is on time-dependent models. So let me uh, try to be a bit more precise about the problem that I'm uh, interested in. So, um, let's uh, suppose that we have a bounded open Lipschitz domain, the flow domain that we are either in 2D or in three space dimensions. Here's our equation again with this decomposition of the Cauchy stress that I mentioned to you. And what uh, we shall suppose is that uh, there is a relationship between S, this uh, shear stress and uh, the symmetric velocity gradient, D of U, which is in some kind of nonlinear form, G of S D of U is equal to zero. So it's an implicit constitutive relation. So once again, the notation use the velocity field, P is the pressure, S is uh, because of uh, this conservation of angular momentum, S is symmetric. Uh, this is our shear stress and D of U is the symmetric velocity gradient. So what we will do is instead of thinking of an implicit constitutive relation, we shall associate with this implicit constitutive relation a monotone graph. And these were these pictures that I tried to indicate on, on, on this previous uh, drawing. So we shall identify the implicit relation with a graph, which is defined on the Cartesian product of D by T, D by D symmetric traceless matrices, which is where S comes from, with D by D symmetric traceless matrices where D comes from. So this is our implicit relationship and we shall identify that uh, with a graph where if you like on the horizontal axis, you have D and on the vertical axis, you are plotting S and you have some kind of monotone relation. So what we'll assume is that this graph A is a maximal monotone graph, R graph. And this R graph property uh, uh, concerns the growth properties of the graph, but I'll be precise about that in a second. So there are certain axioms that are assumed here. So it is assumed that the point zero, zero is contained in the graph. And this was the case in all of these pictures that you saw on the previous slide. We shall assume that uh, the graph is a monotone graph. So this is the monotonicity property of the graph. The third property is maximal monotonicity, which simply conveys the fact that there are no holes, there are no gaps in uh, the graph. So if you like, you could put your pen on the paper and you could, uh, without lifting the pen from the paper, you could draw out uh, a continuous graph, even if it's discontinuous as a function. And the fourth property, and this is where this letter R comes, comes from, is associated with this, uh, uh, principle of maximal entropy uh, production that I illustrated in the case of Navier Stokes equations when we tested this, uh, when we checked the scalar product and we were looking for a lower bound on S scalar D, and we found such a lower bound with exponents two and two. Well, what is assumed here uh, is that there is a similar sort of property in the graph that the scalar product is somehow bounded below by uh, the matrix norm raised to the power r and the matrix norm of s raised to the Hölder conjugate r prime of r. So these are the assumptions on the graph. So let me now come to the numerical approximation to the problem. So the first issue is that because there are potential discontinuities in this graph, even though it may, so we shall approximate uh, this uh, implicit constitutive law uh, with a sequence of explicit laws SN. So the first step is somehow to mollify this potentially discontinuous uh, graph. So 
one way of doing this is, for example, you make a measurable selection from the graph and you take a convolution with uh, some maybe co compactly uh, supported function in L1. And so pictorially, you are replacing this discontinuous constitutive law with something that is now continuous. And then eventually we shall pass the limit with this modification so that this red curve in the limit steepens up to the discontinuous graph. There are lots of ways of doing this. Here's another way of, of modification. Uh, this is called the Yoshida regularization of the graph where you are replacing this discontinuous graph with something that is now continuous. And once again, you can pass to the limit uh, with, uh, with N and approximate the discontinuous graph. So in some way, you first of all modify uh, the discontinuous graph. The second uh, step in the construction is to approximate the problem on a grid, so you have your flow domain and you take your mesh generator and it generates a computational mesh uh, consisting of maybe triangles in 2D or simplices in 3D. And you would like to discretize your partial differential equation on this uh, finite element grid. So there is a discrete velocity space V sub H where H is the granularity of the grid. And this uh, velocity space consists of piecewise polynomial functions on this grid. And VH is contained in the natural function space for the velocity. It's this Sobolev space with perhaps a zero boundary condition on, on the whole um, of the boundary. And then you have your pressure space Q sub H, which is contained in the natural function space uh, for the pressure. It is a Lebesgue space with a certain index. I'll come to this index R tilde in a second. The zero down here simply denotes uh, because the pressure is only determined after constant. Somehow you have to fix the value of the pressure and you can fix it in various ways. Perhaps you demand that the integral mean of the pressure is equal to zero or some in some other in some other way. So the zero is not zero boundary condition as in the case of the Sobolev space, but it uh, con uh, concerns the fact that you are fixing the pressure because of an arbitrary constant in the pressure. So there are certain sort of uh, assumptions on these finite element spaces. It is, it is assumed that the union of these velocity spaces as you run through all mesh sizes is dense in this Sobolev space and uh, the sequence of uh, the union of these pressure spaces as you run through all grid sizes is dense in uh, the appropriate uh, pressure space. So let me just uh, say uh, uh, a few words about this R tilde because this unfortunate R tilde will somehow haunt us throughout the talk. You don't see this in the case of uh, the Navier-Stokes equations where R will, would be two and R tilde would also be two, but because we are now no longer in the, this nice Navier-Stokes setting, we have R, uh, the index of the Sobolev space, we have R prime, uh, the Hölder conjugate of R, and this R tilde is by definition either R prime if this um, index R is greater than equal than the dimension, or if uh, you are below uh, the dimension, then it is not R prime, but perhaps a smaller number, which is this dr over twice d minus r. Okay. So the first step in the analysis, because what I'm interested in is uh, the analysis of, of the convergence of finite element approximations is to understand what happens at the level of partial of the partial dif differential equation itself. So how exactly would you derive an energy inequality if you encountered such a model? So you would take your, uh, your balance of linear momentum uh, equation. So for Navier-Stokes, this would be the Navier-Stokes equation, and you would test it with the velocity field itself. Now, I have to emphasize that this is a formal calculation because at this point, it is not clear that U itself is a valid test function. And we will have problems with precisely this issue. There will be instances when the velocity is not a valid test function, but this at this level is a formal calculation. So we test the equation with uh, the velocity field and you can see here F dotted with U integrated over the domain. In the pressure term, we have performed partial integration and moved the gradient from the pressure across onto uh, this test function U. There's a sign change. There are no boundary contributions because U is supposed to be zero on the boundary. In uh, the viscous term, we have performed integration by parts. There was minus divergence of S 
Now there's a sign change and the divergence moves over onto U. It becomes a gradient, but then because S is symmetric, you can replace the gradient by the symmetric gradient. And this is the convective term, which is tested with U. Now I, I have highlighted two terms in blue. And uh, you can see from this that uh, because divergence U is equal to zero pointwise, this blue term will trivially vanish. This uh, first blue term, uh, also vanishes, it turns out, and this is just a simple calculation again, because of the fact that the divergence of u is equal to zero. And therefore you lose the first blue term because divergence u is zero and you lose the second blue term because divergence u is equal to zero and you are left with this equality. At this point, you can appeal to this fourth axiom of this monotone R graph and bound as scalar du below by this quantity here. Uh, the Lebesgue LR norm of du raised to the power r, and similarly for the stress tensing, the conjugate uh, index. And then, so the objective would be to hide this u into the left hand side. So it's basically hold that inequality if you like, or you can just recall the definition of a negative Sobolev norm of f and bound this expression above, uh, like so. And then using Young's inequality, you can kick this d of u back from. Uh, uh, the right hand side into the left hand side and you end up with a very nice energy inequality where the data f bounds d of u and s. So then the question is how exactly can you replicate this argument on the discrete level? Please bear in mind that when we work with finite element approximations this d of u will not be pointwise equal to zero. So the fact that these two blue terms vanished was uh, relying on the fact that d u is equal to zero. So let me just for a second reinstate the two blue terms. So this is one blue term. As it turns out, uh, in the theory of mixed finite element methods, uh, this is a familiar issue. And uh, this term can be uh, easily made uh, to vanish simply by demanding that if you replace u by uh and p by ph, d uh, which comes from a finite dimensional space, is orthogonal to pH, and we'll see this on the uh, next slide. The vanishing of uh, this first blue term relies on div u being equal to zero, and if div u uh, is now div u h, and div u h is now not pointwise zero, it is not clear how this term will vanish. And we'll come to that in a second. So the purpose would be to replicate this argument now at uh, the discrete level. So as I said, concerning the second blue term, this is sort of familiar territory in the field of mixed finite element methods. Uh, one can simply make sure that uh, the velocity space uh, and the uh, pressure space for the finite element method are chosen in such a way that uh, this equality is true. So basically the divergence of the discrete uh, velocity is perpendicular orthogonal to the pressure space. And there are lots and lots of ways of doing this. So this now goes into the theory of mixed finite element methods. There is lots of choice in terms of various finite element spaces that you could use in order to ensure that this is true. If you are more ambitious and you would like uh, d u h to vanish pointwise, now this is a sort of slightly more demanding, but there are constructions of finite element spaces that uh, ensure that d u h is pointwise divergence free. So for example, these constructions by Scott uh, and Bogelius, or more recently by Guzman and Nealon, where they are instead of piecewise polynomials using uh, piecewise rational rational functions, which are sort of piecewise on on the grid to ensure that the uh, UH uh, is is pointwise divergence free zero. In the case of uh, uh, this sort of option B even though we have dealt with the second blue term, we still have an issue with the first blue term. How exactly to knock out this first blue term when the UH is not pointwise um, equal to zero? Now there are tricks, again, these come from the theory of the Navier-Stokes equations. For example, if you look up Tenan's uh, book on the Navier-Stokes equations, this is described there. What is done is instead of using div u tensor v dotted with w, you take one half of that expression, and then in the other half, you perform partial integration. So what you have is basically a compromise. You take one half of the original convective term and another half of it, which comes from integrating by parts. And when the view is identically zero, 
this uh, modified or sort of this partial integration based uh, uh, trilinear form is exactly the same as the original one. And it also has the nice property that when the three entries in this trilinear form are the same, then this expression is obviously equal to zero. And this is precisely the property that we need, because what we need is even if the VUH is not uh, pointwise divergence free, we need such an expression to vanish. So if we are in option A, what we will do is replace the original trilinear form by this uh, modified trilinear form. So I'm going to state uh, the convergence theorem in a second, but let me just uh, be precise about the numerical method. So what we are doing is N is uh, coming from this graph approximation from steepening up uh, the modification in the graph and H is the mesh size. So we have sort of a two parameter family of discretizations for the velocity with the index N that comes from the graph approximation and H from the grid. And similarly for the pressure coming from the appropriate finite element spaces that live in the appropriate sophomore spaces that satisfy this equality here. So you see the graph approximation SN of S, you see this uh, modified trilinear form for the convective term, you see uh, the approximation of the pressure term and the source term on the right hand side, and you see the discrete imposition of divergence U equal to zero. So here's the theorem and uh, what we have is the following. So if we are, let me uh, look at case B first of all, if uh, we are using finite element uh, uh, functions for the velocity which are pointwise divergence free, then as long as R, this is the Sokolov index here, is greater than this critical value of 2D over B plus two, then we have certain weak convergence results, which I shall come to in a second. And in case A, when we are only discretely divergence free, then for R greater than a slightly larger number, 2D over D plus one, we have these weak convergence results. And the reason for this discrepancy between these two cases comes from the fact that in case A, we have replaced the original trilinear form by this modified trilinear form and the boundedness properties of this original trilinear form are slightly worse than those of the original uh, trilinear form in the convective term that uh, uh, you encounter in case B. So one way or the other, you have weak convergence of the velocities in W1R, you have weak convergence of these approximate stresses to um, a stress that lives in a function space, you have weak convergence of the pressures, and this triple USP satisfies the weak formulation of the equation. Furthermore, this pair D of U, uh, that, so the symmetric gradient of the velocity, and this S that you have converged, this pair lies on the graph. So let me draw your attention to the fact that the test function in this weak formulation of the problem do not come from the same space as uh, for the velocity itself. So U comes from W1R zero, whereas the test function comes from W1. You remember this R tilde, which is sort of like the Hölder conjugate, but not quite. So this is the conjugate of that modified Hölder conjugate. So the conjugate of the conjugate is the original number. And because R tilde is not uh, the same as R prime, the prime of that is not the same as R. So this R tilde prime is unfortunately not R. So the test function and you unfortunately need not come from the same space and this will cause problems. So in the remaining time, let me just run through the proof of convergence because I think it's, it's uh, quite interesting. So the first step in the analysis is to uh, fix the mesh size and pass to the limit with uh, the graph approximation. So as long as the mesh is fixed, we are operating in finite dimensional spaces. The existence of uh, U and H contained in uh, the velocity space, so the existence of a numerical solution, follows by an application of a modification of Brouwer's uh, fixed point theorem, the, sort of a nice result in, in the book of uh, 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 Giro and uh, Rabiar. So it's a nice little consequence of Brouwer's fixed point theorem. And you can show basically using the same argument as the one that I showed you that you, you have such a bound on the sequence of uh, velocities and stresses using this axiom four from the property of the R graph. And then because we are operating in finite dimensional spaces, it follows from the bolzano weierstrass theorem. Uh, this is sort of a sequence in a finite dimensional space that you have strong convergence or pointwise convergence, weak convergence is all the same. 
uh, in, in this norm LR. For the second term, you have to appeal to our Oglu's theorem because even though D of UH comes from a finite dimensional space, this S is some function. So these guys converge now weakly to an object and it is possible to identify this object as precisely S of DUH using Minty's method. So this is the first step uh, in the analysis. So now we would like to uh, pass to the limit uh, with uh, H. So, but before doing so, let me just remark that one can also pass the limit uh, with N, as we are doing here in this inequality using uh, weak law semi-continuity. So this is what is done here. And by doing so, we arrive by passing to the limit in N, we arrive at this uh, next inequality that we have. So it follows directly from step one by weak law semi-continuity that we have this inequality. So now we have boundedness of this sequence and we have boundedness of this other sequence. Again, by appealing to Alonglu's theorem, um, these D of U's will weakly converge to D uh, U and these S of D U H's will weakly converge to something. Let me denote that something by S bar. What is not clear at this point is whether this pair D of U and S bar lies on the graph. Now, this is very important because if this is not the case, then the constitutive relationship has been violated. So the question is whether this pair D of U and S bar that you have converged to weakly lies on the graph. So in other words, is it true that this S bar is S of D of U? Now, in order to show this, uh, uh, we, we have to do some sort of uh, technical step. So in order to show that D of U S bar lies on uh, the graph, what we will do is motivated by the fact that we are dealing with a monotone graph, consider this object here, S of D U H minus S of D U, scalar with D U H minus U. By using Holder's inequality and the bounds that we have from uh, step two, what we have is so it's a simple application of Hilbert's inequality, we can bound this scalar product by a constant because each of these entities is bounded above uh, in this one in LR and this one in LR prime, Hilbert conjugate. So this whole expression is bounded above by a constant. We also know that this AH is greater than or equal than zero. So I could have dropped these uh, uh, absolute value signs because uh, this guy here is non-negative, but I wanted to emphasize the fact that what we are dealing here is a bound on the L1 norm of a certain quantity. And if a sequence is bounded in L1, unfortunately it doesn't uh, automatically follow that you can extract perhaps a weakly convergent subsequence. What comes uh, to uh, the rescue is a wonderful uh, result called Chacon's biting lamb. And I would like to refer you to this uh, beautiful paper by John Ball and Francois Murat uh, on, on the Chacon biting lemma, which says the following, that even though you may not be able to uh, extract weakly convergent sequences in L1, what could nevertheless be done is you can consider an increasing uh, uh, sequence of uh, subsets of the set omega, which eventually exhaust the set omega in the sense that the measure of the discrepancy between omega and uh, the kth member of uh, the sequence converges to zero. And, but then on each of these omega k's, you can find a subsequence for which this object up here now weakly converges not on L1 omega, but on L1 omega k. So this is sort of good news, but we still have a problem. And the problem is the following. So what we would like to do now is go back to the equations and use monotonicity and the equations together. The problem is that if you were to use the equations, you would need to use U as a test function, but U is not necessarily a legit legitimate test function. So you can't just plug in U as a test function into the equation. So what we need to do, so sort of a further technical hurdle, we have to go through a process called Lipschitz truncation. And so why is this Lipschitz truncation needed? I, I think I've sort of explained this. Uh, so if R is small, then this difference UH minus U is not necessarily contained in uh, this Sobolev space where the test function should come from if you were to use U as a test function. So this is not a valid this is uh minus u is not a valid test function so you can't just plug it in as a test function 
So the idea would be to approximate this UH minus U with a Lipschitz function so that it becomes a valid test function. But you need to do this in such a way that when you approximate it, you only alter UH minus U on a set of small measure. So for example, you can't just uh, mollify this UH minus U uh, with, with some smooth function because that will change this UH minus U on perhaps a large set of uncontrollable size. So uh, what comes to the rescue is a result by Acerbi and Fusco published uh, in, in this uh, collection of papers uh, up in Edinburgh, which is about this Lipschitz truncation method. And what we ended up using in the analysis of this uh, convergence proof is we had to build a discrete counterpart of this uh, Lipschitz truncation method of Acerbi and Fusco. So what happens in this Lipschitz truncation method of Acerbi and Fusco is the following. So you have a Sobolev function, maybe from W11 with a zero boundary condition. And you consider the maximal operator, it's hardly little good uh, maximal function associated with the gradient, which is defined like so. So this has a nice property uh, in that uh, it is uh, then V. So V is then Lipschitz uh, continuous function on this set. Um, which, uh, so these this sets are the sublevel sets corresponding to lambda. So you consider lambda and you consider values of M, um, uh, the maximal function below that uh, uh, value lambda, and V is Lipschitz continuous on uh, uh, these sets. Uh, the proof of this comes from this inequality, V of X minus V of Y in absolute values bounded above by the maximal function of the gradient uh, of uh, uh, V at X plus the maximum function of gradient V at Y times X minus Y. So as long as you are on this set where the maximal function is bounded by lambda, you have Lipschitz continuity. So let me denote by G, G for good. So this is the good set. So on the good set, you have Lipschitz continuity. And then the idea of Acerbi and Fusco is to use uh, Kirchbrand's uh, extension theorem to extend from this good set, the function on the whole of the domain as a Lipschitz function. So this is the idea. So then the good news is that as long as you are on the good set, uh, V lambda and V coincide. And then the other piece of good news is that when they don't coincide, the measure of the set when they don't coincide is small. So V lambda is this uh, uh, Lipschitz truncation uh, of V. The bad news is that the Lipschitz truncation of a finite element function, unfortunately, does not belong to the same finite element space uh, that uh, uh, the original function belonged to. So you have to go through some acrobatics to ensure that uh, you end up in uh, the same finite element space. So I'm going to come to this definition of this discrete uh, Lipschitz truncation in a second. What we are using here is a, a special projection. It's a discretely divergence preserving projection which comes from the theory of mixed finite element methods. So this is this operator P sub H that takes a function and um, puts it into a finite element space uh, in such a way that somehow the divergence is preserved. So what we'll do is consider this difference UH minus U that we saw on the previous slide, project it using this projector and denote this by E sub H. So here's this Lipschitz truncation result that uh, comes from this paper with Lars Diening and Christian Kreutzer. And what it says is that you can take uh, your uh, EH from the previous slide, you perform this Acerbi Fusco Lipschitz truncation of that function, you project it back using this uh, projector that I described to you on the previous page, and you end up with a finite element function which has some nice properties. It is Lipschitz, but with a controllable Lipschitz constant, which is between these two values. And most importantly for us, the measure of the set where this finite element function does not agree with the original function is quantifiably small. So this is this red property. So I'm coming now uh, uh, to the end. So let's go back to this quantity A sub H that we saw previously. So what we'll do is uh, consider E H, uh, this pi H uh, of U H minus U, which is from uh, the finite element space. We perform a discrete Lipschitz truncation of this function at some high level, two to the two to the power J is the level at which you are discreetly Lipschitz truncating this function. And what you can show is 
using uh, various bounds on this quantity a sub h that you have this sequence of inequalities. So we take a sub h here to, which is non-negative to the power one half. We split it into two bits, one on uh, the good set where the Lipschitz, discrete Lipschitz truncation agrees with the original function and on another set where they disagree, we perform Cauchy Schwarz. That's, uh, so this is this inequality coming from uh, the first integral. We perform Cauchy Schwarz also uh, uh, to get this term here. Then we use uh, properties of the Lipschitz truncation to show that this quantity here is bounded in a nice way by two to the power minus j over r, and then use the property from this discrete, uh, discrete Lipschitz truncation to argue that when these guys do not coincide, this discrepancy, the measure of the set where they don't coincide is small. So what we find therefore is such a bound on this AH, and this is valid for all values of j, j coming from this Lipschitz truncation. So you can pass to the limit with j, and what you find is that this AH, this quantity here, must converge to zero almost everywhere. So this is good news because now you have almost everywhere convergence of this quantity. Also from the biting lemma, you have weak convergence on subsets. And therefore what you find is using Vitali's theorem, putting together weak convergence with almost everywhere convergence, you get strong convergence of this quantity uh, to zero. And then recalling the fact that you have weak convergence of S of duh to S bar and D of uh to du, you uh, deduce this equality here, then you can appeal to the property that you have a maximal monotone graph to deduce from this last equality that in fact this limiting object D of U that we were worried about earlier on does in fact lie on the graph almost everywhere on these bitten sets with bits of omega bitten out, these omega k sets, and then using a Cantor type diagonal argument, what you can show is that in fact you have um, uh, inclusion of these guys, not only on omega k, but almost everywhere on the graph. So this is basically uh, the end of the proof. Now, I realize that I'm almost out of time. So let me just uh, comment on some uh, extensions of these results. So we have extended these results uh, with Tabea Chapel to time dependent problems. And then in the second paper, we have looked also at uh, the uh, unsteady case with other uh, mixed finite element approximations where we, we were using instead of a velocity pressure approximation, a three field approximation involving a finite element space for the stress as well. And then in this third paper, we also looked at the uh, non isothermal case. So there was a temperature equation and again, convergence uh, was proved. So there, there are some numerical experiments which are on, on the next slides, but I, I think uh, I'm out of time. So let me, let me uh, stop at this point and thank you very much for your attention. If you ask me questions, maybe I can show you some computation. So thank you ever so much for your attention. So thank you, André. Uh, now it's time for question. And I think, uh, of course, me, I'm really interesting to see the numerical result, but I think there are more uh, questions on the theoretical part. So no question? Moi, j'en ai une, Olivier. Ah. Moi, j'en ai une. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Uh, complex fluid is not really my specialty, but uh, um, if you want to have uh, fluids with memory, uh, I suppose you need time uh, variable, the time variable. I suppose you can extend what you did to um, time dependent problem, can't you? Yes, yes. So, so indeed, uh, this first paper here on the list, so the first blue reference concerns time dependent problems, but uh, these are still not problems with uh, memory. So I think if you were to introduce memory, it would be more like an integral differential uh, equation with some kind of memory <clears throat> kernel. I, is, is that what you're thinking of, perhaps? Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. So what one could one could do that we haven't done that. Um, so. I, I, what, what, what can I say? I, th I think there are just so many of, of these models. You can go in so many different directions. So what you are what you are asking is obviously a very relevant class of models. Thank you. 
Andre. Thank you. So Albert, you see you have to... You... So, uh, very beautiful talk. I, I, uh, so I understand you have absolutely no convergence rate. Do you, in that's maybe going to the numerics, do you observe them? Do you observe optimal uh, rates yeah. of convergence? <laughs> so. Okay, I'm glad you asked this, Albert. So what happens is obviously at this general level, you have convergence to a weak solution, there is no uniqueness because these assumptions that have been made are not sufficient to guarantee uniqueness of weak solutions. Okay. So yeah. We have done numerical experiments and we see convergence and we have tested, in, in fact, one could look at, you could look at the paper, we have tested rates of convergence and what we see is that you do get the expected rate of convergence, you know, optimal rate of convergence when you have maybe a sort of a a synthetic uh, uh, model exactly. problem with a pre-designed solution. You do converge uh, to the solution with the expected rate of convergence. But when there is a unique solution, you will converge to it. We haven't done a convergence analysis because in this setting, there is no unique solution. So it's difficult to talk about which, which solution exactly we, will you be converging to. But in the numerical experiments, we do see optimal rates of convergence to um, uh, the solution. So, uh, uh, André, uh, yeah, can you see some numerical result and uh, which, which numerical scheme did you use to solve this problem? Because this is not so simple. I try uh, maybe two or three years ago and uh, I don't uh, succeed in uh, less than two days. So <laughs> I think it's a difficult problem. <laughs> exactly. I think I, I think we can share your share, <laughs> share your experience, Frederick. In some of these problems, especially for small values of R, for example, these Bingham fluid type problems are extremely uh, uh, horrible to solve. So uh, we are solved. Uh, we solved it uh, using this Fire Drake software. We are using. Uh, 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 sort of Scott Vogelius elements typically on barycentrically refined meshes. The meshes were generated with uh, something called a GMSH uh, yeah. mesh generator. We used the Newton solver. I think the residual uh, was uh, take, if it falls below something like 10 to the minus eight, we stopped the Newton uh, iterations. And for the linear solvers, we were using oomph back. Yeah. So for the stress, we were using P1 elements for the velocity P2 on these very centrally refined meshes. And for the pressure, uh, we were using uh, P1 elements discontinuous. Okay. So this is a solution. Uh, so this, uh, uh, so this problem, is a solution uh, for an unsteady problem. Nebbia Stokes on uh, the right hand side, uh, sorry, Nebbia Stokes on the left hand side. So what is, yes, maybe it sits on the left-hand side. And uh, what you see here is, is uh, an implicitly constituted model, which is sometimes maybe a Stokes, sometimes Euler, sometimes Bingham, okay. depending on which region of the domain you are in. So near the boundary, it's a maybe Stokes fluid. In the middle of the domain, it's an Euler or a Bingham fluid, depending on whether you are below or above this critical uh, parameters. So it's a sort of a combination of, of everything. Yeah. So there's a discontinuity in the graph and we had to use something called the uh, Papa Anastasio regularization, which is a sort of a modification of the graph and so on. So these are the steady state solutions. Yeah, it's really impressive. So more question? Yes, if I may, actually. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yeah, hi. So I was wondering about, uh, because you mentioned something about, uh, no, one of your references refer to condition numbers. So mm -hmm. I was wondering how is the condition number of the iterates you get in your numerical solution strategy? Uh, yes. Um, so let me, let me go back to this third reference. So here in this third reference, we were looking precisely at the question of preconditioning um, of uh, these problems, because the linear solvers really grind to the halt with, with some of these, when, when R is close to one. So when you're sort of close to Bingham, uh, linear, so iterative solvers are, are very slow. So if you look at the details of, uh, 
of this paper. This paper. Is that Gabriel? Yeah, it's me actually. Yes. <laughs> hi, Gabriel. Yeah, hi, I don't hi, see hi. a picture. I'm just guessing from your voice that it is you. So yeah. So if you look at the details in this third paper, we were looking at uh, uh, preconditioning. So what was done in the third paper is we used this deep disk stabilization in Navier Stokes. Then we were constructing preconditioners. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I'll look at it. Thanks. Thanks. So what is on the remaining slides is what is on my to-do list. And what is on my to-do list uh, are non-monotone relationships. Yeah. So there well, are some uh, numerical experiments, but this is sort of work in progress. So it's not really part of uh, the talk. I'm very happy to talk about this at some, some other time. But so these, those are even more horrible problems. And there are physical situations when these non-monotone non constitutive relations are but the, the measure issue, if you are non-monotone, exactly. you have non-uniqueness of the solution yeah, in yeah, your yeah, law. Exactly, exactly, exactly. You, you hit it right on the head. So what we can prove in that case is convergence to some kind of young measure solution. And so, okay, so since you asked me, there is a theorem that you have convergence to a young measure solution, and we have done numerical, so there's a non-monotone stress-strain relation. And what we see are oscillations uh, in in uh, the shear stress, and these are precisely the kinds of oscillations that are reported in the physics literature in the stress, and we see these uh, oscillations. So these red bits are oscillations in the stress in this non-monotone relation. But anyway, so so there are lots of lots of open problems to look at. Yeah, that's well. Uh... Hello, Andre. Oh, so, Eve, hello. <laughs> I have a question about the beginning. Why do R graphs need to be R and R prime? When you are uh, a graph constitutive relationship, you put R on one and R prime on the other. Any reason? So that goes, so let me go. You know, you put right. holder, holder. That's, that's uh, basically, her, yes, yes. Uh, okay. it's basically holder. So just, just as in the case yes, of but, Navier Stokes, you end up with two and two. So if you play this game with, for example, this power law fluid, you, you, you repeat this exercise with this power law fluid, what you end up is basically R and R prime. So it just comes okay. out from the algebra. So you choose your model and you, you run through this exercise, checking this sort of uh, maximum um, entropy production and what comes out are precisely R and R prime. Or, I mean, you, you can generalize this, you can take a convex function and it's a convex conjugate. Okay. So it's somehow natural that these come out. Okay. Uh, so for me, it's to continue the free frame days with the tutorial. So I will shut the the Zoom and I reconnect the Zoom in two minutes uh, to starting the tutorial things. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Andre, thank for you. this excellent thank talk. Thank you very much. And, uh, lovely to see you all. Lovely to see you. Yeah, all. and uh, I, I put your slide in the FreeFM uh, website.